Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Principal Podcast. Appreciate you joining us today. My guest today is Bill Staten. Bill, how are you? Great, Arch. How are you doing? Great, great. I'm really excited to have you on today. Um, creativity, innovation, empowering innovation. These are all sorts of things that you stand for and something that I've been thinking a lot about recently, as I can imagine, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience have as well. Um, excited to discuss these topics with you today. But before we before we jump into that, what kind of um, inspired your obsession with empowering creativity in others? I think it's because in the work I do, I see so many people who don't think they're creative. I think there's so many missed opportunities for creativity, for innovation, uh, because people think it's this lightning bolt that only strikes from above and it only strikes the gifted few. And they mm -hmm. don't think of themselves as part of the gifted few. And therefore, they they don't even try. And, you know, our education system doesn't help with that. Uh, other things don't help with that. And um, I mean, I worked in a very creative field for a long time. I was the producer of a sketch comedy TV show for 15 years. And, you know, we had to be creative on demand every single week for 15 years, whether we felt like it or not. And when, you're, when your paycheck depends on you being creative, on being innovative, you, you can't afford to wait for some magic lightning bolt. Mm -hmm. So we had, you know, we had to figure out how to do it. It turns out it's, it's, it's not a gift that only the gifted few have. It's, it's, a, it's a talent. It's a skill that we all have. It's our birthright. We all have it. And, you know, mm -hmm. We all own it free and clear. I, I think we just kind of forget that we have that ability. And so it's it's frustrating when I see people um, going through life feeling like they don't have that creative spark. Mm -hmm. You said a lot of a lot of things there that res really resonated with me that I want to touch on later in our conversation. But I really do want to highlight that you've won twenty nine Emmys, which is is a very very impressive feat. I actually see them in the background there. Um, not that anyone can see the video right now, but. 29 Emmys. That's a super impressive feat. So, you know, hats off to you, first of all. Thanks. There's a bunch you don't see there. I've got, I've got 10 broken ones in a bag in the garage. Uh, we had an earthquake. I live in Seattle. We had an earthquake here a couple of decades ago. And um, mm -hmm. there, I don't know if you can see, it's a really poorly designed statue. I mean, the Emmy, it's got a weak ankles and the, the globe is weak and the wings are weak. So if one of those, if they, if they just tip over, they shatter like an egg. <laughs> so... I've got a bag of broken Emmys in my garage. I always thought if I ever write my memoir, that's going to be the title. A bag of broken Emmys, the Bill Stainton story. Things things you can say when you have enough to go around. Yeah, that's that, true. That's awesome. So where do you think this idea um where do you think this idea came from that only the gifted people are allowed to have creativity and the rest of us don't have it? Like you're either born with it or you're not. I can totally relate to this myself, um, feeling like that at times, but also just, you know. In a lot of conversations that I've had, people just tell me, hey, I'm not creative. Where does where does this idea stem from? I I think it comes from two places, Arj. I think, first of all, we tend to kind of deify the geniuses, you know, the Edisons, the you know, Marie Curies, the, you know, the Elon Musks before he went crazy. Um, the, you know, Steve Jobs, people like that. And I mean, the ones, the ones who invent the iPhone and the internet. You know, the big, huge innovations, you know, the, 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 the earth shattering, global changing innovations. And we tend to think that that's, that those are the only innovations that count, that that's, that's what creativity is. Creativity mm -hmm. is Einstein, Edison, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk. Those are just the, the big ones. So when we think that that's what creativity is, then we think, well, yeah, and that's not me. Therefore, I'm not creative. We make this false syllogism that, you know, if a creative person is Steve Jobs and I'm not Steve Jobs, then I'm not creative. Well, it's a faulty premise to begin with. But I think also it, most of us don't have to be creative on a daily basis. Now, when I was, when I was producing my TV show and writing jokes for The Tonight Show and things like that, I had to be creative. So I was constantly reminded that I'm creative. It was constantly reinforced because that was just part of my day to day. Um, just like a, an airline pilot is constantly reinforced, reinforced. Oh yeah, I can land an airplane. It's just be becomes part of the DNA. 
So creativity was part of my DNA, just like it is for any artist or, you know, the people we tend to think of as creative types, musicians, poets, things like that. The rest of us who don't have those kind of jobs, we're not called upon to use creativity on a day-to-day -day basis. We can, it's available to us, but because we're not called upon it, we don't really make use of it. And over time, we tend to forget how to do it. And when we forget how to do it, we tend to forget that we even have the ability to do it. So my mission in life is to simplify and demystify creativity and innovation, to let people know that everybody, everybody has this. It's actually much easier than people think. So if I'm following correctly, it sounds like creativity is more of a skill, more of like a muscle that you have to work on. Yeah, that you that's exactly it. Right. As opposed to being something that you're just genetically disposed to, or it's like a gift that you get, right? Right, right. Now, obviously, just like anything, there are some people who are going to be better than, at it than others, mm -hmm. but it's available to everybody. I mean, everybody can do it. And like, like almost any skill, the, the more you do it, the better you get. Just like a muscle, just like going to the gym. You know, if you stop going to the gym for a while, your muscles are going to get weaker. If you keep going to the gym, the muscles are going to get stronger. Same thing with creativity. When you start looking at the world through a creative lens, you start seeing opportunities everywhere. Just like if you look, you know, if it's actually, I was going to say a uh, different size of the same coin, but it's actually the same side of the same coin. Just like if you're looking for humor. And because humor and creativity are very closely tied together. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, uh, MRIs have shown that people coming up with jokes and people coming up with creative ideas, it's the exact same parts of the brain that are firing in the exact same order. So it's, so it's, it's the same mental process. If you go through the world looking for humor, which is what I did for 15 years when that was my bread and butter, mm -hmm. you'll find it. It's out there. Just like if you go through the world looking for things to be angry about, you'll find them. They're out there. Yeah. It's all a matter of what you, where you choose to put your focus. And if you choose to go through life believing that you're a creative person and looking for those opportunities, they're out there. They're all over the place if you know what to look for. Yep. You've really just got to have that firm belief that you are the type of person who can be creative. Yeah. 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 And again, I think people make it, make it too complicated. Like they think of creativity because we – it kind of goes back to what I was talking to earlier. There's this phrase, creative genius. And again, we tend to think, well, if I'm not a genius, I can't be creative. Um, cr you don't have to be a genius to be creative. Cre creativity has nothing to do with IQ. Creativity, it's, here, here's how I define it. Again, I talked about this misconception that creativity is this lightning bolt that comes down from above and only sure. strikes the gifted few. It's not a lightning bolt. It's really just a matter of what I call connecting dots. So what are the dots? Anything ideas, experiences, other people. Mm -hmm. It's when you look at something and go like, oh, you know what? This reminds me of this. And you connect those two dots. The classic example, of course, is Gutenberg with the printing press. Well, the printing press was not, you know, it didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of a wine press, you know, pressing grapes for wine and movable type, both of which already existed. The wine press had existed for thousands of years, movable type for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. But nobody else had made a connection between them. What Gutenberg did was he saw a wine press being used. It was pressing out this red juice. And he thought, oh, you know what? That, that looks kind of like ink. Wait a minute. What if, boom, boom, and he connects the, wine, the idea of the wine press with the idea of movable type, and boom, there is the printing press. That's how it works. It works by looking for connections. Um, the way people can use this in their business is by saying, okay, who, out, who else outside of my world ha has been successful? Okay, what did they do? Now, how can I apply what they did to my world? How can I make that connection? And all of a sudden, you've got an innovative thought. You're not, you're not having to invent, invent anything out of scratch. You're just looking, what have, what have some other people done? And, how can, and that's the key question. How can I apply that? to my situation? How can I apply that to my world? How can I make that connection? Mm -hmm. That's really, it, it, I mean, it's really that easy. Yeah, that's, that's, that's actually really funny that you said the thing about comedians earlier, because while I was prepping for this podcast and kind of um, 
doing a little more research on your background and, and these sorts of things, I started to think, man, comedians are really some of the most creative people that we have, right? Because yeah. they're literally just always connecting dots, finding, you know, going through daily life, finding inspiration from anything, and then just starting to connect dots and, and thinking of things that resonate with people. Because like, you're not going to make repetitive jokes that people have already made in the past, right? You have to be original in order to, in order to get a laugh. Right, right. Yeah, and how many comedians do you see or or hear where they say something and you laugh and think, oh my goodness, that is so true? Because they've connected a dot. I mean, those dots were out there, but they make that connection. You know, this is like that, and boom, that's the punchline. And you're laughing because you realize, oh my goodness, we do that. That's, um, it's funny, this is going to be a weird example, but I remember the first time I ever saw the Book of Mormon, the play, the Book of Mormon. Yep. And... Um, there were a lot of members of the Latter-day Saints in the audience. You could tell because they all had little name tags on saying Elder, John, and Elder, whatever. And I loved seeing their reaction because, you know, the Book of Mormon could have been, you know, perceived as insulting and that sort of thing. Um, it was certainly um, uh, um, not faithful, perhaps. But, <laughs> like, almost every three minutes... They're like poking each other inside going, yep, we do that. Uh-huh. Yep. That's because they recognized just what, what somebody else is, is pointing out. And um, sometimes that's that's all it is. But yeah, yeah. So comedians do that all the time. They observe things that are open to the rest of us, but they see it a little bit differently because they're looking at it through the lens of humor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, when I was doing my TV show, again, that was my paycheck depended on that. So I went through the world, every input that I got through my senses, my first, I mean, the first filter it went through was, is this funny? And then if no, can I make it funny? And because again, that's, that was my job. And it's the same thing, you know, you, and, and that, that's what a comedian does. Yeah. Is they go through life looking for those things and they find them. Oh, this is interesting. Oh, this is weird. Oh, look, look at how we do that. That's strange. Mm -hmm. They notice those things. Those things are available to all of us. It's just that comedians and conversely creative, innovative people go through life with a different filter. Sure. It's the way you look at it. What then is the difference between creativity and innovation? How is innovation any different? That's a really good question. And a lot of people confuse them and, and think that they're the same thing, creativity, innovation. Um, the way I describe it is this. Um, Creativity or innovation is turning creativity into money. That's what innovation really is. Sure. In other words, it starts with the creativity, but innovation is all about taking something creative and creating something of value from it. So that could be, I, I say, turning creativity into money. Money could also be time savings or whatever, but you know, something of value. So creativity is a part of the innovative process. It's the ideation. It's, it's the coming up with all the ideas. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's evaluation and there's implementation. And, and those are important parts of innovation. If it's just coming up with ideas, that's great. But at some point, you got to think, okay, which are the ideas I'm going to actually do something with? You know, which are, which are the good ones? Which are the crappy ones? And how do I take the good ones and turn them into something? How do I implement? How do I bring them into the world? in a one way, shape, or form. It might be a new joke for a comedian. It might be a new product for a company. It might be um, you know, a new idea for a podcast. As soon as you put something on a, on a podcast, okay, now it's out in the world. And um, so that's, that's innovation. Innovation is the end result of applied creativity. You know? I like the way you think about that. So it sounds like what you're saying is, <clears throat> creativity is just those ideas and the initial kind of dots that you connect, right? Between yes. the experiences that you've had, the circumstances you've been involved in. And innovation is just the result that somebody might perceive value in, right? How do you, how you take that creative idea that you've got and then put it in somebody else's court and make them find it valuable. That's the innovation. Exactly. And creativity can exist without innovation. I mean, you just get together with a bunch of people and come up with interesting ideas. Yeah. And that's, and that's fine. It's, it's a good, it's good mental exercise. It's a, it's a good process to go through, but then if nobody takes it, you know, if nobody takes it and runs with it, 
then all you have is a fun time coming up with ideas. Mm -hmm. So you said something earlier about back when you were um, producing television shows mm -hmm. um, back in the days of, of winning all those Emmys. Um, you said that creativity was kind of like your job, right? Like your paycheck literally depended on you being creative yeah. every single week. So yeah. I'm trying to understand what the relationship is between creativity and, and like those deadlines, that stress that you put on yourself of having to complete something by a certain date, right? Is there yeah. a relationship between that? Because the way that I've always thought about it, creativity is something that happens when you don't really have constraints, when your mind is just kind of free flowing. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people think that, that, that creative people just want to be like free to explore and do whatever they want. My experience has been, and my research has shown that it's actually kind of the opposite. Creativity loves constraints. In fact, I often tell corporate clients, if you want to get creative ideas with people, um, give them, give them the, you know, here's, here's what I want ideas about and then give them not quite enough time and not quite enough money to come up with this because you like these, these constraints. Um, I'll give you an example. If you go to a creative person and say, okay, I want you to write a story for me, a short story. And you've got two options. You can either write a short story about anything you want in the world, or you can write a story, a, a short story about a duck who wears a hat. 98% of them are going to go with a duck who wears a hat because now they've got something to latch on to. Now they've got something to focus. In fact, probably as soon as I said a duck who wears a hat, you and your listeners probably already started coming up with a part of a story. Oh, why does a duck wear a hat? What kind of a hat is it? What's going on with the duck? Is, 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 the, is it the only duck who wears a hat or are other people wearing a hat? Where is the duck where he needs, he or she needs to wear a hat? You know, and all of a sudden, and all of those questions are, are jumping off points for creativity. Whereas if you say, you know, write a story about anything, I don't know what to write about. But you give constraints. For example, you talked about with my TV show, we had a deadline. You know, we had, we, we aired Saturday at 11.30 uh, here in Seattle. We actually pushed SNL, SNL back a half an hour. We were the NBC affiliate. So here in Seattle, we were on at 11.30 and they were on at midnight. Um, and, you know, we we had to go on the air at that time. Th there was one time when um, uh, we had the opportunity to do a, a, a comedy bit with Michael Jordan. And this is when he was absolutely in his prime. Sure. And, you know, he was in Seattle. And somebody called me, somebody from our sports department said, hey, we've got, you know, five, ma five minutes with Michael Jordan that we're not going to do anything with. Do you want it? And they said, but here's the thing. It has to be done in his hotel room. So I got my writers and rather than saying, write a sketch about anything, I could say, okay, here's, here's the parameters. It's Michael Jordan. We've got five minutes. Has to be done in his hotel room. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, now we can focus. Now, now we kind of have something that we can hang our ideas on. And so we did. We did a fake promo with him or something like that. But um, having, having those constraints gives, gives you a focus. So I think, again, my experience has been that creative people love to have um, a little bit of a target that they're shooting for. I, I tell um, corporate leaders that here's, here's the way to lead a creative team because leading a creative team which is what i had to do for 15 years it's it's a slightly different kind of leadership i said here's the thing as a leader your job is to give them the what what are we trying to accomplish and then let them surprise you with the how so you give them the what let them surprise you with the how and they will surprise you because they'll come up with things if you give them the what and the how then you've just sucked all the juice out of them because mm -hmm. creative people love figuring things out. They love solving a problem. I mean, that's, that's really what, what gives them fulfillment. So you take that away by giving them the how, and now they're just, you know, robots. But you let them surprise you with the how. And like I say, they will surprise you because they'll come up with things where you'll go, oh, I wouldn't have come up with that. That's better than what I would have come up with. Mm -hmm. If you're a leader who's able to let go of his or her ego and do that. Yeah, that's that's interesting because like a lot of the a lot of the corporate organizations that I've been a part of or at least kind of um observed from afar mm -hmm. have so many processes and bureaucracy in place that like 
it's just impossible for them not to give you the the how and the what, right? right. Like you were just saying, if you take away the if you take away the how, people will surprise you with how they how they reach those conclusions, how they come up with those outcomes for you for your organization, yeah. right? But because these organizations are so large, they 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 kind of have to have a process to the way things are done. And that process scares people from ever approaching higher level management with new ideas for, for the how on how to do things. Right. Yeah. So do you think yeah. that like, do you think corporate organizations stifle creativity and, and therefore stifle innovation as well? Um, and if so, what are some ways that we can start to counteract this? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question and something that people have been wrestling with for, for quite a long time. Right. And yeah, I think you're right. I think larger corporations do, or at least, well, yeah, most of them do stifle creativity and innovation, even though they they talk the talk of innovation. Um, and the reason, I think the reason is, or one of the reasons is that, uh, and this is not a unique idea to me, is that corporations are invested in what's already bringing them money. They can't afford to risk that. Mm -hmm. And innovation is, by definition, doing something different. So that's one of the things that especially large corporations are really scared about because they can't afford to um, stray too far from what they're already doing, right. which is the antithesis of innovation. You know, it's, it's let's just keep doing what's bringing us the money. Mm -hmm. What they're really afraid of is that some young upstart in a garage someplace is going to innovate something, a business model, a product, a piece of software, a service, something that's going to make them obsolete. And so what most corporations do is they they search for those outliers and then they buy them. Um, but that's kind of creative, it, right? <laughs> well, it is. I mean, it's it's, it's <laughs> one way to way. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah. it's one way to do it because again, you you can't afford to I mean, th there are some corporations that, that do it, that they have like a separate innovation branch or something right. like that. But again, here we're talking about like the, the big disruptive innovations. Mm -hmm. um, there are all kinds of different, there are process innovations, there are business model innovations, there are product and service innovations, uh, but they can't afford to take a huge chance. This is something that Lauren Weinstein talked about on your, on your podcast um, yeah. uh, a short time ago. She talked about minimizing the risk somewhat, but you don't, you don't have to bet the farm on every innovation. Mm -hmm. Most or most corporations don't have to. I live very close to where Boeing builds all the big airplanes, and sometimes they are betting the farm. You know, when they come up with a whole new model, that's that's a huge roll of the dice. But that's just, that's the nature of their business. Um, but what what other corporations can do is do like a limited release. Okay, let's build a prototype, and we're going to allot a hundred thousand dollars to it or 10,000, you know, whatever. And we'll do a test market. We'll roll it out for a week or we'll roll it out only in Pennsylvania or we'll do, you know, you can, you can try things and minimize the risk. You will make a prototype and, and see what happens. Again, you don't have to have this huge fanfare and if it doesn't work, we're going out of business kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you can, you can do something that dips your toe into the water a little bit before you right. dive all in. Yep. Right. But innovation at its core is really just looking at a situation and asking, how can this be better? Mm -hmm. And anybody in a corporation can do that. Any, if, if you look at the Monday morning meeting and find a way to shave a half hour off that meeting every week, that's an innovation. It might not be something that's going to get you on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, but it's creating value. That mm -hmm. value saves time for everybody who's in, who's in that meeting. So that's why I like to think that innovation is for everybody, including the quote unquote non-innovators. Because just think about it, if everybody on your team kind of always had this on their mind, looking around going like, ooh, how, how can we make this better? You know, this, this isn't really working well. This, this kind of bugs me. Or here's something that bugs our customers. How could we make that better for them somehow? Um, that's, that's where an innovator comes from looking for problems looking for because for, to an innovator a problem is an opportunity because a problem if there's a problem that means you can solve it
And again, I said, innovators love solving problems. Anytime you see a problem, that's great for an innovator because, oh, I can, I can fix this. I can do something about this. I can make it better. And just like problems come in all shapes and sizes, so do innovations, which, which is why it's not just about inventing the iPhone or the Tesla or, you know, a rocket ship to Mars. It's, it's inventing things like, you know, the curved shower rod or coming up with a new business model. Like, oh, hey, just like I'm a, I'm a keynote speaker. That's primarily what I do. Well, in 2020, that all went away. So my colleagues and I had to invent, okay, how can we do this differently? Same messages, but how can we do it virtually? We all learned how to use Zoom. We bought lights. We bought cameras. We did all that kind of things. And some of us did it better than others, but we had to we had to change our business model, our delivery model. Well, that's that's an innovation also. You know, how do you do that? So in innovation, there's all sizes and shapes of innovation. And even the largest of corporations can take advantage of those little innovations within the corporation. Like I said, you don't have to bet the farm. Um, and or just look for the other innovators and and buy them for you know two hundred fifty million dollars. Right, that's uh that's really interesting because um, I'm actually reading. I don't know if you've read Lynchpin by Seth Godin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so it's yeah. a very similar concept that he talks about in his book as well. Um, kind of how we applied the whole industrial age, the factory model to every large business organization that we run now. And like if you're looking for employees as an owner of one of those businesses, you're not looking for somebody who's the most creative, right? Like you're looking for exactly. someone who can go in and like kind of, you know, follow the process and just execute the way that it's laid out, but you're not looking for somebody to go in and kind of innovate. And that's not a blanket statement for all organizations, of course. Sure, that's, sure. Just, that's just for large organizations. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. And it also goes back to our, to, to the education system that most of the world has. Uh, Sir Ken Robinson talks about this in his TED Talk, which is still the most watched TED Talk of all time. Mm -hmm. And he says that basically we are, we have an education system that is beautifully designed to graduate people based on the industrial age. Um, but it doesn't work anymore because, you know, you and I have both read the research that, you know, the highest paying best jobs of 10 years from now don't even exist now. So how do you train people for them? Well, you can't because you don't know what's coming down the pike. The, the, the rate of change is so rapid. So what should we be training people for? We should be training them for creativity and innovation because that's the insurance policy. That's the master key. Because when you know how to innovate, when you know how to be creative, which is, again, my mission in life, you can, it, do, it almost doesn't matter what's coming down the pike because you'll have the tools to deal with it. If all you know how to do is make widgets and all of a sudden three years from now, widgets become obsolete, you got nothing. But if you know how to deal with problems, you know, if, if you know how to look at things and think creatively about them, you'll, you'll always be employable. But our education system doesn't do that. And the problem is, you know, we've all read the research that, you know, you know, kindergartners all think they're creative and then first graders half of them and then third graders very few of them and that's and uh i'm, I'm getting I'm, I'm not being accurate with the numbers but the but the the, but the idea the is idea, there. it's the same yeah um and what happens is at a certain point in our education system we learn that the the correct answer is more important than the question right you know the teachers if we can come up with the with the correct answer you know, and teachers, teachers don't like the creative people. I, th th that's a horrible blanket statement, but even teachers will say, that. I wouldn't say that's horrible. I've definitely experienced that a couple of times. Yeah. In my, I mean, yeah. because they're the troublemakers. They're the ones who will question you. And you're just like, oh, I don't get paid enough for this. Anyhow, just tell me that right. the answer is four. Yeah. Uh, don't, you know, just, do. and we eventually kind of get molded into giving the correct answer that becomes everything and that stays with us for the rest of our life which is another reason why people don't think they're creative because creativity is more about the questions innovation is more about the questions than the right answer uh there's there are very few questions for which there is only one right answer right and and and, and one way of arriving to that right answer yeah yeah right. exactly yeah
So do you think that that kind of made a pop uh, question pop into my mind? Do you think there's a relationship between a person's um, rebelliousness as part of their character and their ability to be creative and ask those questions and, and just question the status quo in general? Wow. that's Maybe, maybe rebellion isn't the right word, but I think you well, understand where I'm coming from. Yeah. Um, I think there is, maybe I need to be careful here because, you know, it's like there's a, maybe it's a fine line between creativity and criminality. I don't know, but, um, <laughs> But I know there's a lot of creative people, myself included, when we were in grade school uh, and we got the report cards, I don't know if they still do report cards or not, but one of the things always was, you know, just he won't behave in class. You know, he'd be a great student if he would just shut up, you know, or words mm -hmm. to that effect. Um, I, I do think that people who were the class clown or rebellious in other ways I think they I think they have a leg up when it comes to creativity because they've managed to hang on to that sense because usually the rebellious people are the ones who are connecting dots. They're seeing things differently. They're seeing things slightly differently than everybody else. And that's perceived as rebellion. And sometimes it is rebellion, but they see things differently. And that's what you want. When you're looking for creative ideas, you want people who see things differently. Uh, that's one of the reasons. Every now and then, when I'm when I'm booked for a keynote, um, let's say it's for um, uh, Department of Transportation workers. That's that's one I've got coming up in a couple of days. Sure. One of the things that in the initial conversations, well, have you ever worked with Department of Transportation? Do you know anything about building roads or things like that? And no, I don't. I mean, I'll do my homework, but you're not bringing me in because I'm an insider. You're bringing me in because I'm an outsider. You're bringing me in because I'll ask the questions that nobody else there is going to ask because they'll either feel too stupid to ask it or they won't even think to ask it because, they, because they're because they so... It's, it's, it's outside of their scope. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so you, you, want, you want those people who see the world differently in those meetings when you're trying to come up with a with an innovative solution I, I just read something this morning uh an article and uh I'm, I'm i'm probably gonna forget some of the details but this so, some company some like startup tech company got a contract um million dollar contract and what they needed to do was find a way to find very small amounts of impurities in the in in, in oceans and um, that could be really, really difficult. And so they had all these, uh, you know, smart people, you know, computer people and that kind of stuff trying to come up with how to find, you know, these, like, again, very small amounts of impurities. And all of a sudden, a marine biologist somehow got into the conversation. And he came into the next meeting with a bunch of clams, literally clams. And he just dumped them on the table. He said, there's your answer. What do you mean there's your answer? Well, it turns out the clams can detect the smallest amount of impurities in seawater. And when they do, they open their shells. So now all these people, the software company had to do was come up with a much easier solution, which is how do we, how do we know when clams open their shells? Well, that's a much easier problem to solve than how do we detect trace amounts of impurities in the seawater. The clams are already doing the work. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden they's like, oh, well, that's, that's a relatively easy problem to solve and a very, very inexpensive problem to solve. But you wouldn't have solved it if that marine biologist hadn't come into the meeting. So it, it takes somebody who sees the world differently, who sees the world through a different lens. And sometimes that's what the answer is. But you've got to be open to it then. You yeah. can't say, no, 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 that's stupid. You're a marine biologist. That's not what we're talking about here. You've got to be able to take your blinders off and go like, oh, hang on a second. That's And again, that's an example of connecting dots. Mm -hmm. The marine biologist knew something about clams. Okay, what does that have to do with this? Well, impur impurities. You know, the whole that, that's that's the connector detecting impurities. Okay, this company wants to. Turns out clams can already do it. There we go. So, would you go as far as to say that open-minded people are the most creative? I would say open-minded people are the most receptive 
to creativity. And we all like to think we're open-minded, mm-hmm. but, we all, but we're all wearing blinders in one way, shape, or form. And sometimes those blinders are, you know, prejudices. Sometimes those blinders are, this is my area of focus. I don't know anything about that, and so I won't pay attention to it. Um, but the more open-minded you are, because again, it's about connecting dots, and especially those other dots. One of the things I, I talk about is if all your dots are the same color and the same shape, like if all you do is read articles about your topic area and hang out with the same kinds of people who talk about the same kinds of things, if you're just connect, collecting the same color dot over and over and over again, that's better than nothing, but it's not going to lead to those breakthrough ideas. So if all your dots are, are navy blue, then most of your ideas are going to be navy blue, and that's not going to be very, you know, but all of a sudden you introduce a yellow dot. Mm-hmm. Ooh, a yellow dot and a blue dot make a green idea. And now all of a sudden you start mixing. So you got to look for those yellow dots, those outlier ideas, experiences, people that you wouldn't normally encounter. Uh, you have to proactively look for them. And that does mean you've got to be more open-minded to you know, read things that you wouldn't normally read and that the competition is probably not going to be reading. Mm -hmm. to listen to podcasts that you wouldn't normally listen to, to Mm -hmm. be open to ideas, to talk with people you wouldn't normally talk with. Even if it's a subject that you think you have no interest in whatsoever, there's a yellow dot there if you look for it. There's there's something, there's always something you can find if, again, you're, you're coming at it through that lens that we talked about earlier of how can I apply this to my situation? Because when you ask a question like that, your brain will try and find the answer. And there's always an answer. Mm-hmm. It may not be a great answer. Well, I could apply it this way. Well, that's stupid. Okay. But still, your your brain is now looking for those connections. But that does – but you're absolutely right. It um, That that takes having having an open mind. Yep. Yep. And that's really powerful. So I just, I just want to repeat that um, so that everybody really drills it into their head. Your surface area – of receptivity towards creativity is expanded by having an open mind. That's a smart sentence. I wish I'd come up with that. Say that again, (laughs) your surface area. That was really good. Your surface area for receptivity towards creativity. I don't even know what the hell I just said, but is open. That's okay. Because it's the first part that I'm, 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 I'm awestruck that you could repeat just that first part. That's 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 really smart, but yes, yes, I agree with you because I'd be a I'd, I'd be foolish not to agree with that. You could say I've been inspired by you. Something that you said earlier was that obviously you're a keynote speaker. That's that's right. something that you do for a living. Um, in 2020, this whole concept of giving keynote speeches was kind of dampened, um, to put it lightly. Yeah, dampened is one way of putting it. Yeah, yeah, to put it lightly. Mm-hmm. So that kind of made me wonder about this idea of like being forced into creativity versus proactively going out and seeking it. Is there a distinction between the two? In practical terms? No. Um, It's just that the people who are, who tend to be the innovators, they go out and look for it. But for some of the rest of us, it, you know, you know, we all heard the, 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 the phrase about, you know, some people are born great. Some people achieve greatness. Others have greatness thrust upon them. Uh, the same can be said about crisis. You know, so, some people are born in crisis some, or, or whatever. But, you know, the, 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 people who, the people who think of themselves as innovators first, they go out looking for, doesn't, even, doesn't have to be a crisis, but they, they go out looking for problems that they can solve. Right. They're actively seeking well, those opportunities. Exactly. Yep. Which means they get, they get, they get the jump start. And if you've got somebody like that, that on your team, then you're going to be the disruptor. And somebody else is going to have to react to your disruption. For most of us, we're reacting to disruption. Like 2020 was a huge disruption. Uh, certainly in my in my business and any number of other businesses, that's no secret. Um, by the way, the, one, the, 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 the organizations, the people and organizations who thrived during that were the ones who innovated, were the ones who saw this and thought, okay, this is a big problem. How can I fix this? What can I do? Where's the opportunity here? Which is another way of saying, how can I apply this to my situation? It's it's just, it's asking a good question. If you ask a question like, where's the opportunity here? 
your brain will try to come up with it. So I would say, you know, sit down with a legal pad, not on a computer, like sit down and, and, and say, I'm going to come up with 20 answers to that question. Where's the opportunity here? No matter what here is, no matter what the world throws at you, where's the opportunity? And then don't just stop at one answer. Don't just stop at two answers. Force your brain to come up with at least 20. Because sometimes it's that 20th one that's like, ooh, okay, that's the one that nobody else is going to think about. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, it sometimes that does happen. Again, you know, we're thrown in a situation and we have to either innovate or go out of business. Um, and sometimes, sometimes that's what it takes with people. And so there are two ways of doing that. You can either just sit down and think, okay, how can I innovate? What can I do here? Or you can take the easier route that I talked about earlier. You can look elsewhere and say, oh, how are they solving that problem? Now, in my case, I wouldn't say how are other, I mean, I did, but how are other keynoters solving this problem? I would say, how are how are other people who communicate intellectual property? Because that's really what I do. I mean, key- keynoting on a stage is just, that's, the, just the, that's just the delivery mechanism. What I do is I come up with ideas. I come up with thinking about things. And I, I synthesize thoughts about innovation, creativity, and breakthrough thinking. And I disseminate those. That's what I do. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, doing it on a stage is just one way. Okay, so who else does that? Well, I've got friends who are college professors and elementary school teachers. Okay, what are they doing? So I would look at them you know, because they have they have the same problem that they have to solve, but they'll solve it in different ways than my fellow keynoters. And because again, that's looking at the yellow dot. If I'm just going to be collecting the navy blue dots, that means I'm just looking at other keynoters. What are they doing? I'll copy what they're doing. Well, that's just more of the same. And maybe I'll do it better than them. Maybe I won't. But you look at somebody outside my world, you know, look for that marine biologist. And it's like, oh, how, oh, okay, that's interesting. They're doing something interesting that I wouldn't have thought about. And that, again, goes back to what you were saying about being open-minded. It goes, it's, it's reacting to a crisis, but it's reacting by proactively looking for that outlier, for those outlying solutions, those, those yellow dots. Yep. So, yeah, it, I mean, it actually, yeah, a, a crisis or something like that certainly can and does precipitate innovation because because you have to. But that's that's one of the things. So many organizations, corporations, associations, whatever, they treat, they wait for there to be a crisis, and then they think we have to innovate. And that's in a, that's treating innovation as an event, you know. So okay, this happened, so we have to innovate, and it's tough for them because that means that innovation is not part of their DNA. They're treating it as an event. Mm-hmm. Innovation is innovation. Ideally, is not an event. Ideally, it's not even a process. Ideally, innovation is a mindset. If you're, it goes like this. Okay, we. I'm a widget maker. Okay, that's one. I'm a widget maker who will innovate if I have to. Step two is I'm a widget maker who innovates. Step three that'll put you ahead of the competition is I'm an innovator who happens to make widgets. So innovation comes like I'm an innovator first. That's that's who I am. And this is just how I apply it. Like if I think of myself, I'm, a, I'm, I'm just a keynote speaker who will innovate when I have to. That's one thing. No, but if, if, if I'm an innovator who delivers a message, okay, well, how can that be done? That can be done all kinds of different ways. Uh, so you think of yourselves as an innovator first, then, then you're constantly, just like when I was producing my comedy show, I told you that was part of the DNA. Everything went through that filter of funny or not funny. If, you go through, if everything goes through, through, through the filter of innovation, oh, oh, here's an opportunity for innovation. Again, you'll see those opportunities everywhere. And you'll see the opportunities that the competition misses. And have you ever noticed that it, if you were to name the leader in any industry, you know, like a leading company, my guess is, you know, that whatever company you name is also going to be the most innovative company in that industry. Because that's what we think of as an industry leader. It's the one who innovates. That's why innovation is so important, especially for for corporations. You, you've got to be innovating, or else you're going to be irrelevant in the eyes of the marketplace, in the eyes of your of your colleagues and competitors, in the eyes of your consumers and customers and clients. 
and in the eyes of your employees. You know, everybody talks about we can't get good help, we can't get good employees. I mean, that's a, that's a huge crisis. You know, well, they'll leave because they'll see that you're not really a relevant company. It's this guy over here. Ooh, look at what they're doing. They're doing exciting things. They're moving the needle. I want to be with a winner. And the innovator tends to be the winner. I really like what you just said because it kind of puts that in that mindset into perspective for you, right? You don't want to be the kind of person who says, I have to innovate. You ha- you want to be the kind of person who says, I want to innovate or I am an innovator. And then you, through whatever medium you choose to innovate through, are going to find the creativity right. that other people that aren't looking for. Right, right. Yeah. It's interesting. There was a study done and I, I, I can't cite it offhand. I, I, I should be able to. It was years ago. And so they did this study. They, I don't know who they are, but they are very busy. They do a lot of studies. So they did a study. They were trying to find out, is there anything that separates creative people, you know, the innovators from the non-creative people? And so they surveyed a bunch of quote unquote creative people, Mm -hmm. poets, dancers, singers, artists, you know, actors, people like that, whatever, um, comedians. And they asked them all kinds of questions. You know, did you have a pet growing up? Did your parents read to you? Do you play a musical instrument? All all, all these kinds of things. And then they surveyed a bunch of the non-creative people or the people you would think of as, you know, you you tend to think of as non-creative, you know, accountants, actuaries, librarians, whatever. That's, I'm painting them with an unfair brush, but they asked them the exact same questions. And again, the goal was to see if there's, is there anything that separates the creative people, the innovators from the non-creative people? And it turns out there was, and it was only one thing. And it was that the creative people believed that they were creative. That was the only difference. But, but it's a difference that makes all the difference. Just like we were talking about. If you go through life believing that you're creative, just like if you go through life believing that you're popular or talented or good looking, you'll create a different world for yourself. You'll create a different experience you you will you will create your own universe, mm-hmm. and um, so it is. It's, it is just just a mindset when you when you go through life believing that, and we're all creative. When you go through life believing that, again, you'll you'll see the opportunities everywhere. That's again, I'm, I'm kind of repeating myself, but but the whole message is it's not reserved for the gifted few. You don't have to be named, you know, Steve Jobs to be an innovator anybody anybody's an innovator it's just looking at a situation saying how can this be better yeah there's that power of manifestation that i am slowly but surely really really starting to believe in yeah it sounds woo woo doesn't it but it it definitely does does. yeah yeah but it does it does work yeah we've all known people um who just walk through life just confident and you look at them and go like why why are they so confident that you know I mean, and they aren't necessarily, you know, the movie star looking people or, you know, they look like models. They just, they just have this sense of confidence about them and they create a different reality mm-hmm. for themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, uh, I, I had a conversation with um, two guests, Andrew and Ray from Dualistic Unity earlier this week. And something that we really, really touched upon was this idea of letting go of who you, of yourself, of your belief of yourself and just having faith um, and kind of embracing that uncertainty allows you to just have like this, this deeply held belief and faith in, in yourself that you will figure a way out. Like once you accept the uncertainty of life, I'm probably butchering this, but once you accept the uncertainty of life, you will be okay with it. And you'll just realize that you'll take the challenges challenges as they come head on. Oh, that's interesting. So instead of trying to fight life, you it's kind of like in is it judo or one of those things where you use your opponent's, you know, advantages against him or her. Like they come at you with, you know, and they outweigh you by, you know, 100 pounds. Well, you use that to your advantage and you know sometimes the world can come at you like that and okay you've got two choices you can try and fight it and you're gonna lose because <laughs> you know the world outweighs you quite a bit or yeah that's or, or or you can okay let's let's go with the current sometimes it's easier to swim with the current than against the current yeah and and one of the um one of the quotes that uh andrew mentioned 
I don't know if this is going to be verbatim, but he said that um, fighting back against that force is just leads to suffering and then accept, acceptance leads to peace. That's really good. And I'm sure he said something along us that, you know, acceptance doesn't mean, you know, you roll over and become a victim to it. Right. Yeah. Uh, there, it's a, it's a fine line, but acceptance is that this is what is, what can I do with it? What am I going to do about it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good. See, yeah. that's what I love about your, your podcast. I, I, I've listened to a number of episodes. One up and up until right now, you've gotten interesting people. Um, clearly this is an off week for you, to, uh, you know, this time, but you get interesting people who have interesting ideas on all different kind of subjects. I, I think the, the, um, the common, well, I mean, the common element is you and your curiosity. And that's, you know, that's another thing about innovators and creative people. They're, they're curious. I mean, curiosity is such an amazing trait and that's kind of what gets taught out of us, we talk about the education system, or you look at, um, you know, Ken Ken Robinson's um, TED talk. That's kind of what he talks about. You know, the curiosity gets taught out of us, but it's that curiosity that allows us to look for those yellow dots. Mm-hmm. And the more the more dots we collect of all different colors, the more connections we can make. Because I'm sure, you, just you just did it. You said, oh. That reminds me of this interview that I just right. had. That, mm-hmm. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what the creative process, the innovative process is. It's the, oh, this reminds me of that. This reminds me of that time in Italy when blah, 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 you know, whatever. Or this reminds me of that person I met on the plane. Um, and that's, that's what it comes down to. But in order to be reminded of those experiences, ideas, people, those us, we have to have encountered them in the first place. Mm-hmm. And if we only have, if we go through life with blinders on, if all we do is collect navy blue dots, the same dot over and over and over again, um, we're not going to be able to make those connections because we don't have that collection of dots. So we're going to miss things. Uh, very briefly, we, we talked about you know talk about Steve Jobs. Well, when Steve Jobs was a kid, he was auditing some courses at Reed College just outside of Portland, Oregon. Mm-hmm. One of the courses he audited was a calligraphy course taught by a Trappist monk named Robert Palladino. And now Steve Jobs also, his main hobby, of course, was computers with his friend Steve Wozniak. Now, this is going to be an unfair stereotype, but you and I probably both know a lot of computer people, certainly at least back then, that's all they focused on. All they read was computer magazines. They only took computer courses. They only talked with other computer people about computer stuff. Steve Jobs took a course in calligraphy. That's a yellow dot. That's, you know, they're all collecting navy blue dots, computer, 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 which is, I mean, you need that. But he collected this yellow dot, calligraphy. And when he and Steve Wozniak decided to make their own computer, Steve Jobs said, hey, can can we make a computer that does calligraphy? Nobody else is asking that question. He asked that question. Oh, yeah, calligraphy existed. Computers existed. Just like Gutenberg Steve Jobs is the one who connected those two dots and came up with the Macintosh. And the Macintosh led to the creation of the Apple Corporation, the world's first $1 trillion corporation, led to the creation of the iPhone, which all of us have, which really is our significant other. It's the last thing we ha- we talk to before we go to bed and the first thing we want to reach for when we wake up in the morning. Who would have thought that the, that, that thing, that ubiquitous thing, the iPhone that we all can't live without, owes its very existence in part to a Trappist monk who taught calligraphy at Reed College outside of Portland, Oregon. That's that's the power of collecting and connecting those yellow dots. Yeah, yeah. I really like how you tied that in. Like, it's the variety of those experiences. And then to use, to steal your words directly, it's connecting those experiences together. Yeah. I really, really yeah. like that. And that was kind of the whole, like, I really appreciate what you said about me and and about the podcast. Like that was the whole genesis of the podcast for me too, right? Like everybody would always ask me, oh, so what, like, what's your niche? Like, are you a, you know, real estate podcast? Are you talking about philosophy? Like, are you talking about technology? And I'm like, not really. Like I'm interested in all of these things and I'm just a curious person. So I genuinely, I genuinely believe it when I say that everybody has something that they can teach you. 
from their background. And that's, and that's exactly what, you know, we're doing here. So I, I really do appreciate those kind words, Bill. Yeah. Well, it, it, it shows in the podcast uh, and it shows in your lines of inquiry. I mean, I know that you do your homework um, and it, it, it shows, shows in the podcast too, but you're not, I get the sense that you're not doing the homework because like, oh, that's right. I'm doing the podcast. I better do my homework that you enjoy. It. You want to, you want to do the homework. You want to, because, because again, you're curious and you're interested in yeah. in other things and you never you never know which connection you, you never know which dot is going to lead to the breakthrough you never know which connection mm-hmm. is going to lead to the opportunity of a lifetime exactly and if you miss it if you miss it it's gone yep yep beautifully said hey bill I, we've been very very high level and conceptual which i've appreciated a lot but i just out of my own curiosity i want to ask you what if, what are some of the most like memorable, unique, varied experiences that you've had? Wow. Um, there've been a number of cool ones. A lot of them relate back to the TV show. I mean, you know, producing a TV show was cool getting to work with people like Jerry Seinfeld and Ellen DeGeneres. Uh, I can imagine. Um, yeah. The first time Ellen was on our show, it was only the second time she'd ever been on TV. So that was, that, that, that's kind of cool. And, um, we were in C we were also, we were in Seattle and our prime decade was the nineties uh, for our TV show, which is also the prime decade for the Seattle grunge scene. So in Seattle, the people that we were hanging out with were, you know, we were hanging out with Kurt Cobain and Dave Grohl and Eddie Vedder and those guys. So that, that was cool to see their world from playing in the clubs, from just being, you know, our buddies to all of a sudden becoming global superstars. Um, that that was that was interesting uh, to see that as well, but I'll tell you one one thing that I I do on my on my decade birthdays thirty forty fifty, um, I always try and do something that I've never done before. Um, on one of the decade birthdays, I went I went skydiving. Never been skydiving before. I mean, I've been a pilot for decades, but I've never actually jumped out of a plane. My my goal was always to land it safely. Um, but so so I went skydiving. That was a blast. On another decade birthday, I'm I don't like spiders, but I sought out a place where I could hold a tarantula and a whole bunch of other icky, creepy, crawly things that most people would not want to have crawling around on them. Um, so again, it's just like seeking out those kind of new experiences. It's just fun because you, you're kind of you're kind of in the zone when things like that happen. Mm-hmm. I think. And that's kind of a fun place to be. It's like, um, I don't know if you play any musical instruments. I, I do. And I've, I've been in a lot of bands as a drummer or a keyboardist or whatever. I love going to a blues club and sitting in on drums and then not knowing the song that we're going to be playing because you don't know what's going to, because then you've got to kind of be in the zone and just see what's going to happen. And, play off and feed off of the other musicians. So those are the kind of things that I enjoy. Again, just, you know, seeking out different experiences. I don't know. What, what, are, what, are, what are some of your other guests said? I, I, I have a feeling that's, that they gave better answers. I actually haven't asked that question. Um, oh, okay. That I just kind of felt compelled to ask you just given, good question. I mean, given, given your whole, like, like your whole kind of mantra is, the more dots you have, the more ideas you could potentially have, right? Like right. the more of these dots, creative experiences, um, ideas, et cetera, that you welcome into your life, the more ideas you can potentially have, the more yeah. potential for ideas you have. So I yeah. kind of just had to ask you that. And it's it's really interesting that you said the thing about, um, you know, showing up to a blues club and, and not knowing what you're going to play that like, you buy into that uncertainty willingly, right? Like you. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, yeah. that's exciting. That's thrilling for you. Yeah. 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 It is because, you know, there's a, there's a chance it could fail. Um, that's another thing that um, Lauren Weinstein and you talked about, talked mm-hmm. a lot about, you know, the fear of failure and that holds a lot of people back. My feeling about it is this failure is not failure. Failure to learn from failure is failure. Um, in fact, I, when I talk about innovation with people and they say, well, you know, what if I fail? Okay, first of all, two things. We're used to updates now. Um, 
I, I just found a couple of days ago, I was going through an old drawer. I found my iPhone one, like, you know, the first iteration of the iPhone, the original, the original, now, the iPhone one did, only had one camera. It did not have a rear facing camera. It did not have a GPS. It could not record video. And Apple could have easily said, well, we can't release this because, you know, because it's not perfect. No, they released version 1.0. We're used to that now. So you know, first of all, if you're fearing failure, don't think, okay, just say, look, all I'm doing is releasing version 1.0. It'll get better. You know, but don't let that hold you back from whether it's just writing an article on LinkedIn or a podcast or, or starting your own podcast or launching an online course or starting a business or whatever. It's version 1.0. You'll get better over time. Yeah. And also, I, I just hate using the word failure in the first place because I think look at it like a scientist. When a scientist has a hypothesis and tries an experiment and it comes out differently, the scientist doesn't say, oh, look, well, they, yeah, that failed. They'll go, oh, that's an interesting result. Didn't expect that. Okay, let's let's look into that and see what happened or, you know, what might that lead to? What might the opportunity be here? It's the same thing in life also. It's not a failure. A failure is the label we put to something. All it is is a result that we didn't expect. Maybe even a result that we didn't want, but it's not a failure. It's That's a result. Okay, let's look at it and say, okay, first of all, is there an opportunity here? Because I didn't expect that result, but maybe that's offering a possibility that I didn't see also, that I wouldn't have seen. You know, we all talk about, you know, the, the invention of Velcro or the Post-it note, and those were, you know, mm -hmm. penicillin. Those were failures, but, you know, there's there was a, a positive outcome in those. Or take a look at it and go, okay, so why did we get why did we get that result? Let's let's just look at it. You know, it's it's not a failure. What what can we what can we learn from this? Stop thinking of it as a failure, just think of it as a result. L mm -hmm. look at look at it like like a scientist yep don't be don't be so concerned with having the outcome that you want just just do it and see what you can learn from it and and move on to the next step yeah let me see if i can find this um my buddy bill nye um bill nye oh that's right yeah just yeah part, um, of your, part of your ted talk yeah he was um let's see do i have this uh, I... <laughs> That was awesome, by the way. That was I was definitely not expecting to see Bill Nye. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, shoot, there was something he said in his. Uh, he, he does a master class um, where he said, so, "You, whenever you uh, are looking for an, something about you, you, you you've got to ask yourself how how badly did I want this answer to be the right answer or something like that." He he phrased it so much better than that um but yeah yeah bill and i was an example of, of a yellow dot he was we were you, you, you've seen the ted talk and we were doing our tv show and on the on the day of the show our guest you know a major guest had to cancel and it's like we're, we don't know what to do we're looking for you know who can we get as a guest who can we get as a guest and like everybody was either out of town or whatever and finally um my lowest paid writer uh, who was Bill Nye? He was making two hundred and eighty bucks a week. I still have the contract uh, downstairs. I popped his head up and said, "I might be able to do something with liquid nitrogen." And we're shut up, Bill. We're trying to find a guest for the show. Again, blinders. Yeah, we were wearing blinders at the time. And we didn't think of Bill as being like, well, "Shut up." You know, he's you know he's he, you know like Bill. Stay at the children's table. The grown ups are trying to solve a problem. But finally, we started getting desperate. It's like, okay, Bill, tell us more about this liquid nitrogen. And he started telling us what he could do. And it's like, you know what? We got nothing to lose. And, you know, we have to do a show. You know, it's, you know, again, you, you do the show because you have to. And we put him on the air and it was fabulous. And that night he became Bill Nye the Science Guy. Um, but he was the yellow dot because we were all writers and producers. He was and is a science guy. You know, he's he has a degree in engineering from Cornell. He studied with Carl Sagan. He's, you know. He was the yellow dot, and I almost didn't see it because I was wearing blinders. So, you know, you, that's, that's what you, when you talked earlier about being open-minded, and we all think we're open-minded, and I think I'm an open-minded person, and yet I almost dismissed that because it's not what we were looking for. Mm -hmm. It's not the answer I was I was looking for an answer of who can we get as a guest. And what Bill and I did also was he asked a different question. We were all asking who can we get as a guest to interview? 
Bill Nye was asking, how can we fill the time? And do you see how the asking that different question all of a sudden opens up all kinds of different possibilities? Yeah. Um, it's a completely different world, right? Yeah. Because you're looking for, you're almost looking for an entirely different outcome now. Yeah, exactly. Right. So yeah. often when we just change the question that we ask, all of a sudden it's like, ooh, all, you know, it, it, it can be very clarifying. When you ask the right question, it can be incredibly clarifying. Yeah. So what are some, what are some daily habits that people can instill to um, exercise that creativity muscle? Here's an easy one. Every day, or at least every week, seek out an article, a blog, a podcast, a, a, a piece of music that you wouldn't normally encounter. If you're a country music fan, seek out some hardcore jazz or seek out some opera or something and just listen to a little bit of it. Um, find a podcast on, on a topic that you have no interest in. And listen, just say, look, I'm going to listen to 10 minutes, but I'm going to listen with the intent to find a yellow dot. Like, what can I take from this that I can apply to my world, to my situation? Just practice doing that because what will happen is once you start doing it, again, we talked about just like developing a muscle, your brain will start to figure out, oh, okay, oh, oh we're doing this now? Okay, we're, we're, we're going to be a dot connector now? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And your brain will start to look for those connections. Um, if you want to take this a little more advanced, I would say listen to that podcast and then find 20 yellow dots. Like what are 20 ways? Because again, it's easy. sometimes it's easy to come up with that first right answer. And that's where most people stop. And even in corporations, that's where most people stop. But you go further down, and that, which means that's also where your competitor is going to stop. Maybe the first answer, maybe, maybe, maybe after five answers, you know, you do the easy ones, the obvious ones. Well, those are the same ones your competitors coming up with too. You know, sometimes it's that one that's like 11th, 12th, 15th, 20th, 25th. The ones that where they've given up because they figure, well, that's it. We've exhausted all the possibilities. No, you haven't. There are more there. And even the crappy ones, you know, the ones that, okay, that's a stupid idea. They might be what I call the idea that leads to the idea. You know, that idea that you go like, oh, well, this is a stupid idea, but don't dismiss it right away. Think that's a stupid idea. Oh, but what if, what if we turn it sideways? Ooh, now we've got something interesting. Or what if we take the opposite of that? Or what if we, you know, whatever. Um, so, but that's something that can easily be practiced. Again, just listen to a different piece of music, something you wouldn't normally listen to. And all of a sudden, you know, that's an easy one. And all of a sudden your brain's going to go, oh, oh we're, do we're doing different things now. Mm -hmm. we're, we're being more open to different ideas. Read again, read a blog, read an article, listen yeah. to a podcast, watch a different newscast. Um, you know, just something that's going to cause your, and that might be a tough one, um, but something that'll cause your brain to go like, oh, there, there are different points of view. There are different ideas. And again, you don't have to agree with all those things. If you're, if you're a country music person and you listen to opera and you think, I don't really like this, that's, that's fine. That's okay. But at least it's, at least you now have a, that dot. You've got that arrow in your quiver. You've got that dot in your collection that someday, like, I don't know if Steve Jobs enjoyed the calligraphy course or not. Doesn't matter whether he did or not. He had that, you know, he collected that dot. So now he had it in his bag of tricks that he could pull out. And again, the more dots you have and the more different color, different sizes, different shapes they are, the more connections you can make, the connections that nobody else will see. Because nobody else has your unique collection of dots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that kind of relates really, uh, really well with, with something that you said earlier about like the whole idea of perfectionism as it relates to creativity, right? Mm -hmm. Like perfectionism can kind of stifle this whole iterative process, right? Because you're, you're just like, oh, well, this isn't perfect. I have to keep, I have to keep thinking of a better way about, you know, for this solution, or you yeah. just throw it out entirely rather than saying, okay, what if I turn this on its head? Or what if I thought about this from a different angle? Right, right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Perfection. What's the thing? Perfection is the enemy or good is the, I don't know. There's some, 
perfect is the enemy of good or something like that. Yeah. Or yeah, done. Something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or done. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is. If, 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 if we're not willing to accept anything that's not perfect, well, we're going to have a tough time going through life. You know? So yeah, we've got to be a little easier on ourselves. And again, just think it's only version 1.0 and it might lead to something else. The, the, I mean, one of the things you, you do is you come up with an idea, you put it out there, which is putting it into action, and let the universe, whatever that universe is, tell you, oh, we like this part, we didn't like that part. We don't, you know, you know, because otherwise we're gonna sit in this in, in this little isolation booth and try and predict what perfection is. Well, that's not really up to us. You know, sometimes sometimes you've got to put it out there and let let your audience, your universe say, yeah, this is good, this is good. Be better for this. Okay, guess what? Version 1.2 is coming out or version 2.3 is coming out yeah. based on your input, based on what you told us. That's why, you know, laundry detergents are always new and improved. I don't know what they're doing because they seem exactly the same to me, but somehow it's coming up new and improved. Okay, cool, new and improved. So one last question for you, Bill, before I let you go. Um, okay. This is just something that I've observed from my own experience anecdotally. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I feel like I have my best ideas and my most creative ideas when I'm in like a sleep deprived state. Yeah. Can you, can you relate to this or do you know any research related to this that might be worth exploring? Um, I feel like, I feel like this is an interesting phenomenon and I just want to know if there's any, any actual truth to it. Yeah. Um, there's not, but there is peripheral truth to it. Um, sleep deprivation does not help creativity. In fact, pe- people who are deprived of sleep for one day are l- less creative in the following following day. But there is something that sleep researchers call call N one sleep. It's that stage where you're not quite asleep but not quite awake. Um, and um, people like artists like Salvador Dali and, and inventors like Thomas Edison, and maybe you've heard some of this. What they would do is they would fall asleep or they would go to take a nap holding something kind of sort of heavy, but not too heavy in their hands. Mm-hmm. So when they actually do fall asleep, they would release it and then it would make a sound that, that would wake them up. And then they'd write down their ideas because N one sleep is that stage where you're kind of sort of starting to dream. You're getting what I call micro dreams. It's like these snippets that aren't really fully developed, but you're, but you're also still, there's a party that's still kind of aware of what's going on in your world. Like, you know, if you, if you, if you take a nap, it might be like, okay, oh, I'm starting to get some dreams. Oh, but my neighbor started mowing the lawn and, you know, you're, you're kind of, oh, the cat needs to be fed, whatever. You know. So you're kind of in both worlds. That's the magic part, that, that N1 sleep, which can kind of feel like sleep deprivation because you're not really asleep. You haven't gotten into that REM sleep yet. Um, but that's, what happens is that your brain kind of loosens up and lets itself wander. And that's where it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like your brain is starting to have a party. Kind of like, you know, uh, the disco or the club where all of a sudden people are like bouncing into other people and, you Mm -hmm. know, people that you wouldn't normally see on the outside is like, Oh, boom. And you know, the synapses are kind of connecting. Your brain is kind of, connecting weird dots, which is why the, why the dreams just seem so odd because it's all these different things coming from all these things areas. are just colliding. Right. So your brain is kind of doing this little kind of meandering connecting that that's what it's doing. It's kind of like taking this little walk through consciousness. And that's sometimes where the ideas really come from. And research has shown that people who go into N one sleep and then not quite sleep, but you know, in that N one thing, and then are immediately woken up, like, you know, the balls drop or whatever, and then they're asked to solve problems, they'll solve them more, cre- like, 83% more creatively than people who awoke from a full sleep or didn't sleep at all. So um, that's just how, w- what the brain does. I mean, the brain in that, in that particular arena of sleep is a connecting machine. It's just kind of, you know, all, all over the place. Um, and it's kind of the same thing that happens like in a shower. Uh, that's why so many people say, well, I get my best ideas in the shower. Yeah. Because there are a few things that happen. They're kind of like in N1 sleep. Um, 
it's a safe space, but it's a different space. It's not sitting at your desk. Because when you're sitting at your desk, sometimes it's really hard to be creative sitting at your desk. You know, that's why one thing that's common to almost all creative people is that they take walks. Because, you know, you kind of get out of there. And in a shower, there's nothing else that you're really focused on. So your mind can kind of, uh, it, you know, it's warm and that sort of thing. Um, so your mind can kind of go exploring. Wander. That's yeah, exactly. And that's exactly what it's doing in, in N1 mm -hmm. sleep. So no, it's not it's not the sleep deprivation. It's the type of sleep that lends itself to to creativity. So don't feel like you've got to, you know, I'll be more creative if I only get three hours of sleep a night. No, you won't. Yeah. But that's why it is important to keep a recording device with you, know, like, you know, the creative people keep a pad of paper or, uh, you know, or their iPhone with a voice memo thing or something like that um, next to their bed. So when they do wake up out of that N1, or if they come up with something, they, they can kind of wake themselves up. Um, they can write something down and maybe it'll make sense. Maybe it won't, but that's, that's the most creative time for your, for your brain. Yeah. Yeah. Like something I do, um, is in the mornings when I wake up, you know, I'll just be going through the motions of getting ready for the day or whatever. And then as I walk over to wherever I need to be, if some if ideas pop into my head, I just jot them down in my notes app, right? And yeah. I'll look back at them later and they can be, this can be, oh, wow, this one was really, really stupid. I'm going to delete that. Or it can be, oh, I might write about that. That seems interesting. Right. And I know there are some people who say, and I, I haven't tried this. I don't know why I should. Like if there's, if there's a particular challenge you're working on, um, whatever it may happen to be, you just kind of give your brain that challenge and ask a good question. Not like, what's the answer, but you know, what are some things I could, you know, whatever, Bef before you go to sleep, then when you go to sleep, the theory is that, you, okay, your brain will start working on that. And, you know, your dreams may have something to do with that. They may not, but, you know, but then when you wake up, immediately write down. Um, I've never tried that. Have you? It's, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it works or not. I'm sure there are people who will swear it works and other people who, who will swear it doesn't, but have you had any experience with that? I haven't, I haven't tried that, but it, it's definitely some, worth something worth doing, especially in light of your comments around like the, the shallow sleep state. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah. I don't know why I haven't tried it. I mean, it's, you know, I'm going to be sleeping anyway. Might as well just try it. Might as well. Okay. I'll try it this week. I promise. <laughs> Report back with some findings. I'll do that. Bill, this was an awesome conversation and this was um, a really nice reminder for me that you never know where our conversation is going to go because I feel like we went off on so many tangents here, but Right. That's, that's just kind of me. That's, that's the way my brain works or doesn't work. You know? Yeah. They were all relatable tangents. So I think it, uh, I think it made for a really good episode and I'm really glad you came on. Where can people um, find you online and where can people keep up with your work? Uh, they can find me online. My website is billstainton.com. That's B I L L S T A I N T O N. So billstainton.com. That's where you can find me. Awesome. We will surely link to that in the show notes. And Bill, I look forward to keeping in touch. Thanks a lot for coming on. I think the audience is going to get a lot out of this. Thanks for having me, Arj. It's I'm uh, again, like I say, having listened to a number of your other episodes, I'm honored to be in in the company of some of your other guests. Uh, you, you you do an amazing job. Awesome. Well, you you definitely delivered. So thanks again. Thanks, man. Really appreciate it. <laughs>